Cool. If you got your Bible, find Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs, the third chapter. Proverbs chapter 3. This morning, we are going to look at a few words of wisdom that were inspired by the Holy Spirit, but penned by King Solomon. And King Solomon is writing here to his son and future king, Rehoboam. And I believe that if we will look at these words, if we will lean into them, and if we will then apply them to our lives, they can actually change the very trajectory and course of our lives. And this week, as I have poured over this text, as I read Proverbs 3 over and over and over, I began to recognize a pattern. I began to recognize a particular statement and or header that we see in this chapter 11 different times. Solomon says this 11 different times. He says, do not, or a form thereof, 11 different times in one chapter, he says, do not. And it got me thinking that if I were at work and open up the email and the boss sends an email and 11 times in one email, the boss goes, hey, do not, he's probably trying to make a point. He's probably trying to convey a theme. And right now, as a church, we're in the midst of a theme. We're in the midst of a, a teaching series called Godly Wisdom versus Worldly Wisdom. And over the last couple of weeks, uh, we've talked about a few things that Godly Wisdom does do, right? Pastor Kenneth Kawiso let us off. We talked about how Godly Wisdom, it, it honors and it reveres and it learns from a previous generation, right? Those that have been there, done that, and got the teacher, uh, got the t-shirt. We, we, we glean wisdom from them, godly wisdom learns from an older generation. Last week, we talked about how godly wisdom seeks peace and healing and unity within our relationships. And over the next few weeks, we're going to talk more about the things that godly wisdom does. But today, we're going to talk about some things that godly wisdom does not do. There's 11 things in this chapter, and we're not going to have time today to cover them all. Uh, we're going to get to a few of them. But uh, I promise if you remind me at the end, I'll throw up on the screen a list of all 11, and uh, you can take a phone, a picture with your phone, and then you can sit with Proverbs chapter 3 this week and look at that list, ask the Holy Spirit to speak to you about them. But I want to just jump straight into this. Proverbs chapter 3, if you've got your Bible, verse number 1. Here we're going to see our very first do not. Proverbs 3 and 1, Solomon writes, and he says, My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart Keep my commandments for length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. So here's the first do not. Godly wisdom does not forget God's law. Now, if we go back to the text for a second, we see this word forget, and I'm going to try something new today. So hope this works. I'm not very tech savvy, um, so if it doesn't work, it, it's on my end and, and not on, on, on their end, but hope you, you enjoy this. He says, my son, do not forget. That's a really big and important word, that word forget. It literally means to ignore, or it means uh, to let wither. It means to cease to care about something. So Solomon's saying, hey, 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 son, look, Godly wisdom doesn't ignore or neglect God's teaching. Now, that word teaching that we see right here, this is another really big word. In the original language, in, in the Hebrew, it's the word Torah. Most of you would be familiar with that term. It's the first five books of the Bible, right? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And here's what's important about the Torah is that it was written by Moses, but contained within the Torah are all of the instructions and all of the laws and all of the teachings given to the Jewish people by God. And what we have to understand is that the Torah is not just a list of do's and don'ts, but rather these, these laws and these instructions they actually point to and they give us a picture of, they give us insight into the person, the nature, and the character of Yahweh God. And by the time we get in history to Proverbs chapter 3, the Torah have been around, have been established for 400 years. So we have to understand this. When Solomon says, hey, my son, don't forget my law. Don't forget my teaching. Don't forget the Torah. He's not just saying, son, don't forget the things that I've told you. He's not just saying, son, don't, don't forget the things that, that I've taught you. He's saying something way bigger. He's saying something far more grand and far more important. He's saying, son... Don't forget the wisdom and the insight that has been passed down from generation 
to generation to generation. He's saying, son, this is 400 years of spiritual, cultural, and historical truth. And these words, they define us as a nation. They're more than just ink on a page. They're, they're more than just a list of good ideas. These are the very words of God, and they are timeless. And this law of God has become the foundation for who we are as a people. So he's like, son, look, don't forget. Don't ignore don't let the teachings or the law of God wither. And I want to just pause here for a second because I think there's something that you and I can learn from this even today. Solomon says, hey, true wisdom does not forget. It does not neglect God's word, but rather it makes God's word the foundation for life. So let's put these pieces together for a moment. Solomon is writing to his son, Rehoboam, who is going to be the king. He says, son, God's law, God's word, it's the foundation that this nation has been built upon. Don't forget that. And when you're the king, when you step into that role of authority, don't forsake his law. Now, if, if I may, I want to just interject here because it sounds very similar to me to the founding and the foundation of our nation that was built upon the foundation of God's word that was built upon the foundation of biblical truth and Judeo-Christian values. But if I'm honest, if we were to look over the last 65 years or so, it seems like that, that foundation of biblical truth has begun to be chipped away at. And then if we're real honest and if we were to zoom in, I would say over the last 20 years, we've seen the erosion of this value system, this biblical value system, begin to go into hyperdrive. Now we're at the point in society where people are openly calling evil things good and good things evil. And most of us don't even blink about it. We're at a point in our society where the spirit of this age or, or worldly wisdom says, hey, as a people, as a society, we need to be openly critical of and we need to abolish the values and the structures and the systems and the long-held biblical beliefs that have made us who we are as a people, that have made us a nation amongst nations. And I know I'm preaching to the choir. I know most of you know this. If you've got eyes to see it, it's so obvious to see. But we're seeing now worldly wisdom and the spirit of this age coming to this place of deceiving people where we are now dismantling common sense things. Like, what's the definition of a woman? People can't even define it anymore. Common sense things like as of last year, there are 74 genders you can choose from. And I look at this and I go, what are we talking about? But it's just the tip of the iceberg. Worldly wisdom is trying to redefine and remove the biblical definition of marriage, which by the way is one man, one woman for one lifetime. Worldly wisdom is trying to get rid of and remove the definition of biblical family. They're trying to destroy the nuclear family and take fathers out of the house. And I could go on and on and on, and I could touch on all different types of topics from, from sexuality to race to education to, to abortion to business practices and how we as a nation seem to be slipping, slipping, slipping further and further away from the truth of God's word and what he has to say on these subjects. And I look at it and I go, what does America need right now? Let me tell you what America needs. We need a returning. We, we need a fresh awakening to the truth of God's word, to his laws and his precepts. We need an awakening to his spirit and to his moving. We need the fear of God back in this nation. And I say that because <laughs> the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. That's what Proverbs chapter nine says. But here's the uncomfortable truth. If we want to see these things happen in our nation, it starts here. It starts with truth and boldness being taught from the pulpit. But it starts, hold on, it starts with us as the body of Christ, as the ecclesia, as the called out ones. It starts with us remembering who we are and getting on our knees and repenting of our sin and turning our hearts and turning our faces toward the Lord and asking him to forgive us, asking him to pour out his spirit and to heal our land. But again, worldly wisdom says, hey, no, forget that. 
Ignore that. Cease to care about God's law and actually go to work dismantling his precepts because they're outdated, they're narrow, and they're offensive. Whereas the wisdom that comes from above, or godly wisdom, says, my son, don't forget God's teaching. If we could, let's just look here again at verse number one. Solomon makes this statement. He says, and let your hearts, let your heart keep his commandment. This is a really important phrase. Let your heart, let your heart speaks to our individual need to prioritize and keep the law of God in our own heart and in our own life. Because honestly, it's easy to look outwardly and be like, man, everybody's freaking out right now. Everybody's slipping away from the truth of God's word. Nobody's following God anymore. But the real question that each of us have to make, the real question and observation that we have to, to share is this. It's a personal one. Am I, am I personally following God? Am I in love with his word? Am I following his commands in his precepts? Am I following God with all my, my heart? And when Solomon says that word heart there, he, he's talking about the emotional center of our life and our being. As we look in the mirror, we have to ask, am I keeping God's commandments? Because it starts there. But here's a question for us to consider. How can I keep or how can I follow the law of God if I don't know the law of God? If I don't know his teachings because if I'm not acquainted with it, how can I keep it? So here's the question I wanna to pose to each of us today. Are we reading our Bibles? Simple question, are, are we reading our Bibles? Do we delight in the law of the Lord in our inner man, as Paul would say in Romans chapter seven? L look what David the psalmist would write in Psalm chapter one, verse number one, he says this, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates day and night. Again, this is the question each of us have to ask ourselves. Do I delight in the law of the Lord? Do I think about it? Do I meditate upon it? Do I contemplate it? Do I let it instruct my actions? Because if I do, there's actually a cause and effect that takes place. Let's go back to the text for a second. Look, look at verse number two, Proverbs three, and, and verse number two, it says this, for, for length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. Length of days, years of life, and peace. Length of days. Have you ever found yourself with so much to do that you go, man, I, I just wish there were more hours in the day. You, you ever been there before? That was my life this week. Um, I'm up here preaching this morning, but just to let you in behind the veil, it doesn't just happen. Like I'm not just like with my Bible 15 minutes before service starts and then I pop up here on the stage and I've got this to say. No, I, I spend anywhere from 35 to 45 hours on, on one sermon. So it's like a week long endeavor. But this week in particular, it seems like even though I cleared my schedule, everybody that I know in my world needed something from me. <laughs> right, needed my voice on this, needed my opinion on this. My kids, this is the one week they all had multiple sporting events on the same day at the same time and we're having to run them to different cities. Right, this week was the one week I had all these time-sensitive errands that had to be, to, to be run, and I'm like, Lord, <laughs> I wish there were more hours in the day because I've got so much that needs to be done. If you've ever been there before, Solomon has given us a principle. He's saying that those of us that will keep and prioritize God's word, we're gonna actually find a grace to be more efficient and to be able to get done all that we need to do, that in a sense there's gonna be a lengthening of days to be able to accomplish what needs to be accomplished but he goes on he says not just length of days but years of life years of life again this is another principle we see at work that when we live according to the law and the statutes of God when when we live according to his instruction it actually produces life and brings nourishment to our bodies we see a similar principle and promise that's echoed in the New Testament Ephesians chapter six, and if you were a Christian in the 90s and your parents were Christians in the 90s, after you got spanked, you probably had to quote this verse like I did. I've got it memorized. It goes like this, children, obey your parents in the Lord, 
for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment that comes with a promise that it may be well with you and you'll live a long time on the earth. Again, a New Testament promise that's echoing an Old Testament principle. And Solomon says, look, if we don't forget God's law, length of days, long life, but also peace. It says peace. This is the word shalom. Many of you would be familiar with this word, but this Hebrew word it is not just the absence of conflict. It, it includes that, but it's more. In its greatest sense, shalom actually means to be whole or to be complete. And, and threefold wholeness, threefold completeness, spirit, soul, and body. It, it's the principle that in this life, even when kind of everybody and everything going on around us seems to be in confusion, turmoil, or chaos, that our life, that our entire being, spirit, soul, and body can be whole and at peace. But again, these things, as great as they are, they're cause and effect. And none of them happen without first applying godly wisdom to our life. And godly wisdom is this. Godly wisdom does not forget God's law. If you would, let's go back to the text. Look at Proverbs chapter 3 and, and verse 3. We see our second do not here. Solomon says, let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Here's our second do not. Godly wisdom does not forsake love and faithfulness. Now, going back to the text, that, that word forsake that we see there, it, it literally means to leave or to depart. To leave or to depart from. And Solomon says, hey, look, son, do not let love and or faithfulness leave and depart from your life. He's saying, hey, you have to have great intentionality around making these things a part of who you are. To not let something leave means I am intentionally keeping it. I am intentionally holding on to it. I'm not letting it depart from me. So Psalm is saying, hey, look, you need to work hard to make sure that these things, love and faithfulness, are on display in your life, from your work life to your family life to the, to the relationships to, to the way you treat other people. And hear me again, I want to say this. A lifestyle that's defined by love and faithfulness, it doesn't just happen. There's great intentionality that goes along with it. Look at what Solomon says in, in verse number three. He says this, bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. And that word bind there that we see, it means to tie up. He says, bind these things, love and faithfulness, bind them around your neck. And he's not saying get a piece of string and then a paper that says love and faithfulness and attach the paper to the string and wear it around your neck because that would just be ridiculous. He's talking about, hey, these things need to be a part of who you are. You see, when he says that word neck there, it literally speaks about our will. It speaks about our, our conscience. Again, referring to this intentionality about making our actions in alignment with love and faithfulness. And then he says this, I want you to write them on the tablet of your heart. Now, of course, he doesn't mean this literally because your heart is an organ in your body. But when he says heart, he's referring to the very center of your being. Again, he's talking about your life. He's talking about your words. And he's talking about the corresponding actions that come along with that. that. That's why in Proverbs chapter 4, if you were to just go one chapter over, Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, Solomon would write and he would say this, hey, keep your heart. Above all things, keep your heart and keep it with all diligence. Be great with your intentionality about keeping your heart. Keep your heart with all diligence for out of it springs every issue of life. Your heart is a big deal. So much so, Jesus would actually say this in Matthew chapter 12, that out of the abundance of the heart, out of the abundance of who you really are, your mouth will speak. So let, let's regroup for a second. Let's put all these pieces together. Solomon is saying, hey, look, son, godly wisdom is this. It's being intentionally determined to hold tight to a lifestyle of words and actions that are defined by love and faithfulness. Hold fast to these things and do not let them let me maybe paint a picture for you. I have this memory from when I was a little boy, maybe five years old. And uh, at night, my dad would come into my brother and I's room and 
He would tell us a story. Sometimes he would sing. Most time he would just pray over us and then he would lay with each of us individually until we, we fell asleep. And like any kid, I, I loved being able to lay there next to my dad and you know, that, that feeling of safety and security. But, but there was nothing more disheartening than you know, waking up a few minutes later or waking up in the morning and he's not, he's not there anymore. So, so one, one day I, I decided I need to do something about this. And I came up with a plan it was a foolproof plan that even if I fell asleep, this plan was still going to work. So that night he came in and he laid next to me. And without him noticing, I, I took my index finger and I reached over and I stuck it through his belt loop. <laughs> and I closed my hand around it. And sure enough, a couple minutes later, I, I fell asleep. I'm out for the count. And he decides he's going to get up and, and leave. But when he got up and he left because I was holding tight to him, <laughs> he woke me up. And I wouldn't let him leave. I had intentionally bound myself to him. And this is the spirit, this is the picture that Solomon is trying to communicate to us. That godly wisdom does not forsake, it does not let go of love and faithfulness, it holds tightly to them and it refuses to let go no matter what. Now, this of course stands in stark contrast to the wisdom of the world. See, the spirit of this age says, yeah, go ahead, hold fast to love, hold fast to faithfulness, but only do it as long as it's convenient for you. Because the moment it's not convenient anymore, the, the moment that, that something different or something shinier or something newer comes along or the moment you get bored, then you can go ahead and start looking elsewhere. And that could be a job, it could be a reference to a spouse, it, it could be in reference to a new friend group, and I'll, I'll let you fill in that particular blank. But, but according to the wisdom of this world, love and faithfulness are purely transactional items. Right, quid pro quo. What have you done for me lately? And the moment I get bored, the moment I get offended, or God forbid, the moment my worldview gets challenged, then I'm out. And I'm gonna go take my love, my kindness, and my faithfulness elsewhere. Whereas the wisdom that comes from above says, hey, true fulfillment, and true satisfaction, and true joy, they come from a lifestyle that's defined by love, faithfulness. Even when it gets hard, that's why it says steadfast love and faithfulness, because that's the kind of lifestyle that reflects the person, the nature, and the character of our Heavenly Father. Does that make sense? And then look at the result that we see here of this type of living. We see another cause and effect. Look at verse number four, Proverbs 3 and verse 4. Solomon says, so you will find favor and good success in the sight of God and man. Now, now that word favor, oops, that word favor that we see here, it, it literally means to be thought well of. To be thought well of. And that word success, it's not so much talking about doing well financially, more so it, it's to be seen as a person of wisdom, someone that has wisdom or understanding beyond their Years And then notice this. He says, you're going to find favor and you're going to find success, but you're going to find it in the sight of who? Of God and man. God and man. But because we serve an invisible God, sometimes we forget that our lives are not just lived out in the scope and in the purview of men, but also every day and every action is lived out and played out under the eyes of Almighty God. We're going to find favor. We're going to find success, not just in the sight of man, but in the sight of of God. So just a bit of review here. Number one, godly wisdom does not forget God's law. Number two, it does not forsake love and faithfulness. And then we find our third one, verse number five, if you got your Bible. Proverbs three and five, very famous verse here. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. Any of you know that verse? Here's our third, do not. Godly wisdom does not lean on human understanding. Does not lean on human understanding. Going back to the verse, we find a really interesting expression. Lean on. Lean on literally means to put your full weight. To throw your weight behind. To put your full weight upon something. And fun fact, this expression lean on, it's the same expression that we see in the story of Judges, uh, of Samson in particular, 
Right? Many of you will, will know this, but Samson, as he gets to the end of his life, as he gets to the end of his, his mission, he asks that little Philistine boy, hey, can you take me to the pillars so I can lean my hands upon them? Do you remember that story? Right, Samson, he's this amazing judge. He does amazing things for God and for his kingdom. He rescues the people of Israel from the hand of the Philistines, but he makes some bad decisions. He compromises, and the Bible says he gets, he gets captured. His hair gets cut, which was a symbol of his strength. It was this, this thing, the Spirit of God would come upon him, and, and he's captured. They cut his hair, and they put out his eyes, and now he's in this really sorry state and he's getting led into the Philistine temple to be paraded in front of the people. And he asked this little boy, hey, are there pillars that I can lean upon? Are there these pillars that I can put my, my weight upon? And the dumbest boy in the Bible, that little Philistine boy, knowing that Samson was the strongest man in the world, said, sure, come right this way. Here are these pillars. And Samson leans upon them, puts his full weight upon them. We know what happens. He brings the whole house down. And in that one moment, he kills more Philistines than in his whole lifetime before. God uses him in this amazing moment. And if you're a pastor's kid, you got lots of Bible jokes. Um, goes like this. Who, who's the funniest man in the Bible? Who's the greatest comedian in the Bible? Samson, he brought the whole house down, right? Like... <laughs> But it's that same expression, right? Lean on, to put one's full weight upon something. And Solomon says that the one who's truly wise doesn't lean upon or throw their weight behind human understanding, but rather they, they trust. They trust in the Lord with all of their heart. And this word trust, it literally means to have full confidence. To have full confidence in. So let me say it like this. Godly wisdom does not lean on human understanding, but rather human understanding needs to lean upon godly wisdom. And this is what it means to trust the Lord. It means, hey, I've got full confidence in every season, in every situation, and in every single circumstance that God knows what's best for me and that God is able to perform what's best for me in my life. Trust, it's a big word. Let me give you another superlative that defines trust. You may not like this word, but it's a big one. Submission. Listen, there's no salvation without submission. But the wisdom of this world hates the word submission. It hates the world's surrender. The spirit of this age rages against all types and all forms of authority, especially godly authority. Things like God's word, things like the Holy Spirit. The wisdom of this age says, hey, you need to be your own authority. You need to be the captain of your own fate. You need to make things happen for yourself, and you need to break away from anything that goes against what you feel, because your feelings are king. But the wisdom that comes from above says, hey, remember God, your heavenly Father. He has your best interests at heart. He created you. He knows you. He's for you. He's with you. And you may not be able to see the full picture of what's going on, but he does because he sees the end from the beginning. He might ask you to do something that, yes, may cause you to, to have your, your feelings and your emotions cut cross grain, but that's what submission is. It's not submission until your will gets crossed. And he says, hey, if you will submit to me, I'm the good shepherd. And I'll lead you beside the still waters. I'll make you lie down in the green grass. I'll bring refreshment. And I will bring salvation for your soul. As a matter of fact, look what Solomon says next in verse number six. He says this, in all of your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your, uh, your paths straight. Literally, in, in all your ways. Not just some, not just when you feel like you need him. Not just in the huge things of life, but in the mundane things. In all your ways, in every decision, in every direction, acknowledge him. Now, this word acknowledge literally means to know him. To know him. To be acquainted with him. In other words, you've got to talk to him. You need to know him, what he thinks and what he feels about the particular subject you're going before him on. And if we will do that, if we will acknowledge him, if we'll talk to him, then we'll see another cause and effect at work. He promises to make our paths straight. And this literally means to make level. 
It means to smooth out, to make level. I, I have a friend, and he used to have this billiards table, this, this pool table at his parents' house, and every time I'd go over, we, we would play. And this is years ago, and, and years ago, it was a really old pool table, so if it's still in existence, this thing is like an antique. And the funny thing about this, this pool table, as ornate as it was, um, because it was so old and because probably people had sat on it and, and leaned upon it, uh, it was no longer flat anymore. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't level. So if you got on the wrong side of the pool table and you hit that cue ball, if you didn't hit it just right, it wasn't even going to make it all the way to the far side. It would get up and then stop and then start rolling all the way right, right back towards you. And I don't know about any of you, but for me, when it comes to life, I've actually felt that way before. Right, right where it's two giant steps forward, great momentum, and then it's a huge leap backwards. Things are looking good. We got momentum at, at work. My, my relationships are going great, only for that forward progress to get stifled and then start moving back in the opposite direction. And if you're like me, that's frustrating. Yeah. Right, who wants to be moving backwards? I like it when things work out the way that I want them to work out, but that's not the way it always goes. And Solomon says, hey, true wisdom or godly wisdom doesn't lean on human understanding or human ability to decipher and perform within a particular situation, but rather it acknowledges the Lord, it seeks his counsel, and then submits to his direction, trusting that even when the table of life is slanted against you, he's able to make it straight. He's able to level it out and ultimately get you where you need to go. So number one, godly wisdom, it doesn't forget God's law. Number two, it doesn't forsake love and faithfulness. Number three, it does not lean on its own understanding. And then quickly, just the last two we're gonna cover today. Verse number seven, Solomon says, be not or do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. So here's our fourth do not. The person that's filled with godly wisdom does not see themselves as wise in their own eyes. Let me maybe phrase it like this. Don't think that the way you naturally see things is the way that they actually spiritually are. Notice what he says here. He says, be not wise in your own eyes. And he's not talking about your physical eyes. He's actually talking internally. He's talking about how you think and how you process the world. He's talking about how you perceive things. Be not wise in your processing. Be not wise in your thinking. Like you have it all together, that you know everything that is going on. Now, this is interesting because in the world we're living, we, we know that based upon our past individual experiences, each of us are going to process the life that we've been given differently, right? And those experiences, they become the filters through which we perceive this life. That's why you can have two people experience the same situation, hear the exact same thing, you know, uh, uh, see the exact same thing, but then walk away having had two completely different experiences. Why? Because they've got two different sets of filters, and Solomon's saying, hey, the truly wise person, they realize that their perspective and how they feel about a particular situation may not be the full story of what's really going on. And when we consider that, it actually stirs a question within us. The question is this, if everybody sees the world differently, then who or what is established truth? How do we all get on the same page? If we all see the world differently, how do we get on the same page? Solomon says that the truly orienting thing in this world, true north, if you will, is the fear of the Lord. Not my emotions, not, not my feelings, not my opinions, not my past experiences. He says it's the fear of the Lord, meaning that God is the one that sets the foundation. God is the one that sets the baseline for what truth is. And what he says is truth is truth. Now, worldly wisdom will tell you that your past experiences actually need to define your life forever moving forward, and that your feelings are what define truth and reality in your world. The spirit of this age says that truth, it's subjective, and that whatever groupthink says, or whatever the majority says, or whatever social media tells you, that is truth. But the wisdom of this age is wrong, because the wisdom that comes from above says this, let God be true. Let his word be true and let every man be a liar. 
And the person that's filled with godly wisdom realizes that, hey, even though there are tensions right now all around me, especially in an election year, that although there are tensions everywhere, in actuality, behind it all, there's more going on than I can see. There's a spiritual backdrop that I can't see with my physical eyes. Right, Ephesians chapter six, for we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Our battle's not with people. For all the Republicans in the room, your battle's not with the Democrats. And the Democrats in the room, your battle's not with the Republicans. We, we don't battle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, the rulers of darkness, and against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. In other words, there's more going on around us than meets the eye. There's a spiritual battle going on and being waged, especially in our nation right now. You've probably heard it, but there's this big push. There's this phrase that gets thrown out all the time by society. Be on the right side of history, they say. Which we all know what they're saying. They're saying fall in line and do what the majority tells you to do. And the reason I bring that up is because I think God is actually saying the exact same thing to his church right now. Be on the right side of history. But the right side is his side. And the opposite of his side is evil. You may not like it, but it's true. The opposite of God's side is, is evil. That's why Solomon continues in verse number seven. He says this, fear the Lord and turn from evil. Because you can't be fearing God, be in awe of him, following and obeying him, and still dabbling in evil. No, turn, fear the Lord, and turn away from evil evil. So as believers, we better know what God thinks, what he feels, and what he has said on a particular subject. And then out of fear, out of reverence, and out of awe for him, may we as the church find, find the courage and the boldness to let God's word be our true north. Let, let him be the defining thing in our life, whether it seems right in our eyes or not. And if we'll do this, verse number eight, we see another cause and effect. Solomon says this, it'll actually be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. Now this word flesh, whoops, whoop, whoop. this word flesh, I, I told you. <laughs> word flesh li literally means your navel. It, it, it speaks about your, your gut. It's talking about the internal things. Almost spelled this wrong last service. The internal things going on in your body. And, and then this word bones here, it's, it's the external things. It's your it's your members, it's your arms and your legs, it's your physical body, right? So you got internal and external. And for the sake of time, here's the simple picture. When we embrace God's truth, when we turn away from evil, there's actually a settling and a nourishing that takes place both inwardly and externally. There's an energizing, there's a revitalizing that takes place and it actually settles our countenance and it strengthens our body both inwardly and outwardly. Again, cause and effect. Fear the Lord, turn away from evil and then it will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. Number one, godly wisdom, it does not forsake God's law or forget God's law. Number two, it does not forsake Love and faithfulness. Number three, does not lean on its own understanding. Number four, it does not see itself as wise in its own eyes. And then finally, the fifth one, godly wisdom does not. Look at that. That, that circle is in the right place. It does not despise the Lord's discipline. It does not despise the Lord's discipline. Look at verse number 11. Just drop down a little bit in your Bible. Solomon says, my son, do not. Do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his reproof. For the Lord reproves him who he loves, the father, the son, in whom he delights. Now this word discipline that we see here, it's actually translated training. Don't despise the Lord's training. Don't, don't despise the Lord's loving correction. My time is gone, so let me, let me just say this. The wisdom of this age, it despises correction. It despises discipline. Don't believe me. Talk, talk to a teacher that, that is teaching kids under 25 years old right now. Right In this nation, there is an epidemic of pride and selfishness that's going on. 
But Solomon says the truly wise person, the person that's filled with the wisdom that comes from above, they have the wherewithal to accept and to actually welcome God's correction, his training, because they realize that God's discipline is actually, <laughs> it's actually a grace that's bestowed on their life. Think about it like this. Many of you know I've, I've got three sons. I've got three boys at home. A lot of testosterone. I say it like this, if you've got one in the house by themselves, they're great. You've got two in the house, it's great. The moment you add the third, it's a category five hurricane. <laughs> my oldest is 15, my middle's 13, and then my youngest is seven, he's about to be eight. And let me just say that over the years, there has been ample opportunity for me as a dad to give correction. There's been opportunity for discipline. But I do my best, and I want you to know that when that discipline is administered, it's done out of a heart of love. Right, ne never out of anger. And sometimes what they do, yeah, it, it really upsets me. It really makes me mad. So I have to take a step back and I have to wait till I cool down and I pray and then I come in and I administer correction. And I have this famous line that I use with my boys. They could all quote it back to you. That when that discipline or that training is being given, I say to them, hey son, I love you too much to let you grow up thinking that you can be disrespectful to your mom. Son, I love you too much to let you think you can grow up and treat other people this way. Son, I love you too much to let you think you can keep going down this road because it's not going to end well. And I'm doing my very best to train them and to shape them so that they become the men that God's called them to be. But in the same way, when it comes to God's discipline toward us, we shouldn't view it as punishment, but as training. Right in the same way I bring correction of my boys in love, our Heavenly Father in His great love which He's lavished upon us. Right, His love far eclipses human love. How could human love be better and greater than the one that created it? His love far eclipses human love and we need to accept it when He brings course correction to us. Now, of course, the question all of us are asking, well, what then does the correction of God look like? And this is a difficult topic. A lot of different theological views, and it's one that I've, I've sat with for the last few days, and I've prayed over, and I've written a lot of things out, but this is where I've landed. I believe that for the believer, the discipline of God is not, first and foremost, punishment for sin. God punished Jesus for our sin once and for all. So let me say it like this. God's not going to discipline you with something that Christ died to redeem you from, things like sickness and disease. We've been redeemed from the curse of the law. Sickness and disease is a part of the curse. We've been redeemed from that. And yes, we still do have sickness and disease in this world. It's part of being in a fallen world. Maybe even for some of us, we've given the devil a foothold in our life and he's run havoc on our life and he's brought sickness and disease. But God's not gonna discipline us with something that Christ died to redeem us from. Let me add on to that. God's discipline also does not look like the natural consequences of our bad decisions. For example, if I were to leave here today and go rob a bank and then get caught and go to jail, going to jail is not God's discipline. Now, if I'll lean in, he can use that situation. He can use me going to jail to shape me and to mold me, to make me more like Jesus. But going to jail, that's not God's discipline. That's the state's discipline. And it's the natural consequence of me making a really bad decision. Does that make sense? You understand what I'm saying? Okay. So again, what then does the discipline of God look like? I believe at first glance, it looks like a warning. It starts with a warning. Just like I will warn my children before I bring correction, I believe God's discipline in our lives looks the same way. It begins with a warning, and that warning comes in the form of a word called conviction, where he convicts our heart of the sin that's there. He convicts our heart of the wrong that we're doing. Maybe it comes in a time where you're having a, a devotional moment and you open your Bible and the words leap off the page at you and the Holy Spirit pricks your heart and he says, hey, your life is not currently in alignment with what you're reading. Maybe it comes on a, on a Sunday morning, you're in church and the preacher's preaching under the anointing of God and the Holy Spirit breathes on those words and the Holy Spirit convicts your heart and goes, hey, those, those things I've been speaking to you about, you, you need to give them to me. You need to repent for them. Maybe it comes in the form of a trusted, godly friend speaking truth over your life. They're seeing what you're doing. And they're like, you can't keep going this way. And the Holy Spirit convicts you. That's where I believe the discipline of the Lord starts. It's a big flashing warning sign that says, hey, time to course correct. But if we don't respond to that conviction with repentance, accountability, and a change of direction, 
then the discipline of God goes to the next level. And that next level, I believe, is this, that God begins to bring the things that we do in dark and expose them to light. So now we're left with no choice but to deal with them. Let me, let me give you an example. Multiple times over my 20 plus years in, in ministry, um, in multiple churches around the globe, I've seen this similar thing, this similar theme play out where there's a staff member, there's a pastor, there, there's a worship leader, there's some you know, elder or whatever in the church and they're, they're doing something that's immoral, they're doing something that's unethical, but it's done in the dark and nobody knows about it. And, and, and the Holy Spirit's been convicting them about it, but they choose not to do anything with it. So then finally, God gives somebody else a dream about that person and what they're doing. Could be having an affair, they could be stealing money, they could be cutting corners. God gives somebody a dream and reveals it, or somebody gives, God gives somebody a, a word of knowledge about what that other person's doing, and that person gets confronted with it, and it gets exposed. The things in dark get brought to light, and then it has to be dealt with, which is never a fun process. And of course, there are natural consequences that come with that type of thing, but this is what I believe the discipline of the Lord is. Where he comes, he goes, hey, I'm going to expose the dark and I'm going to bring it to light because I love you too much to let you keep going down this path. There's a way that seems right to a man, but its end is death. And, and the Lord is saying, look, if I don't expose this, if I don't bring it to light, if I don't confront you with this, you're going to keep going down this road and it's going to end with your, your marriage disintegrating. It's going to end with your family getting blown up. It's going to end with you in all kind of pain. And God's going, I love you so much that I'm not going to let you keep going down that road. So my discipline and my correction is I'm going to bring the things in dark to light so that we can deal with them and be rid of them once and for all. And this is why Solomon says, hey, the truly wise person, they don't despise the discipline or the correction of the Lord because the Lord reproves him whom he loves as a father, the son in whom he delights. Let me wrap up this last point by reading these verses again, verse 11 and 12, but I wanna read them out of the Passion Translation. I believe they bring great language and summation to what I've been trying to say. Solomon says, my child, when the Lord God speaks to you, never take his words lightly and never be upset when he corrects you. For the Father's discipline comes only from his passionate love and pleasure for you. Even when it seems like his correction is harsh, it's still better than any father on earth gives to his child. Five things that godly wisdom does not do. It doesn't forget God's law. It does not forsake love and faithfulness. It does not lean on human understanding. It does not see themselves as wise in their own eyes. And then lastly, God's wisdom. It does not despise the discipline, the training, and the correction of the Lord. Now, I told you to remind me, but I remembered on my own. Here's the full list for Proverbs 3, the 11 do nots that we see. Let me just throw these up on the screen for you. The 11 things. Maybe if you wanna get your phone out, you can take a, a screenshot of them. This is what I'd encourage you to do. Is this week, get your Bible. Sit with Proverbs chapter three. Look at this list and say, Holy Spirit, are there any things that I need to change? Is there a course change that I need to make? Speak to me, minister to me. Help me to not just meditate upon these things, not just be a hearer of these things, but to actually apply them in my life. Come on, let's pray together. Father, we love you so much. Thank you for your word. We tremble at your word. Your word that instructs us, your word that corrects us, your word that exhorts us. Thank you for your word that is living, it's breathing, it's active, that is sharper than any two-edged sword. And I pray that today, the words that have been shared, Father, that you would, you would water them in our heart so that they would grow. We don't wanna just leave this place having heard your word, but not do anything about it. Father, we want to apply these things, but sometimes we don't know how. So Holy Spirit, we ask that you would help us. You're the paraclete, you're the helper. Would you lead and guide us into all the truth? Would you help us apply the truth of God's word to our lives? because our end goal is we want our lives to reflect our Heavenly Father. We know we're the light of the world. And our prayer is that men would see our good works and then give glory to God in heaven. Help us, O oh Lord. We need you. 
Our nation needs you. Father, would you breathe upon your church once again? Would you pour out your spirit on your church once again? Would you ignite something in our hearts, a passion for you, a passion for your word? Would you ignite in us again? Would you revive in us a love for the person of Jesus? Would you revive in us a love for the lost? Would you revive in us a love for your word? We need your help. And we submit ourselves before you. We realize we don't have the full picture, but you do. You see the end from the beginning. So, Lord, we submit ourselves before you. And we ask that you would give us the courage to obey you. Because we realize in this life, that's all we have to offer you. It's our obedience. So today we say, Lord, you have our yes. Whatever you speak to us, whatever you ask of us, Lord, give us the courage to say Yes. And Father, I pray for those in the room right now that are troubled about the state of their soul. Those that have come into this place or that are under the sound of my voice that don't know you, that have never submitted their life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. I pray for them. I pray that your Holy Spirit would go to work even right now, revealing to their heart their need for a Savior. I pray that your Holy Spirit would go to work right now doing two things, convicting their heart of sin, but then in the next breath, convincing their heart that although their sin is great, there's an even greater Savior. That even as we sung this morning, our sins, they are many, but God, your mercy, it's more. And Holy Spirit, as you reveal this to their hearts, I pray that you would give them the courage to respond. Give them the courage to submit. Give them the courage to cry out for help. And as they do, I thank you that you apply salvation to their life. We thank you for the promise in Romans 5, 5, that the love of God gets poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. So would you seal them now, Lord? Oh, we thank you for what you're doing in our midst. We love you, we love you, we love you.